It's not often that the seed capital of a business is handed to you on a plate. This is The Architects of Business, Joe's weekly series of interviews with leading entrepreneurs in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. I'm Ty Genwright and today we'll meet Mark Barrett, whose company APC is a facilitator of life prolonging and saving drug research. Mark, thanks a lot for uh, coming in and talking to us today. Um, listen, I want to start by getting you to kind of give a description of what APC does in the same way as you give to your kind of elderly aunt who hasn't got a clue. <laughs> yeah, sure. So a great question. I get asked that quite a lot. Um, so I, I, I guess one way to phrase it is that you, you would hear about the discoveries of new medicines, you know, typically in the news, it could be a cure for cancer or HIV, Alzheimer's, whatever it may be. Um, what many people don't actually know that beyond that discovery is there's a huge amount of you know pretty complex science and biology that needs to take place to figure out how to make that discovery into a viable process a chemical process or a biological process that can be made so these medicines can be made all over the world and supplied to patients you know all over the planet Mm. so i guess what apc does we have some very unique uh, technology coupled with a great team of chemical engineers chemists biologists and we essentially come up with these processes to make these drugs and i guess uh the pharma industry, I guess, you, 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 again, you hear about this, is under a lot of pressure in terms of the time it takes to develop its drugs, the cost it takes to do it. And I guess our innovation is helping reduce the time and reduce the cost to develop these drugs. And is that the way it's normally done, where the, the kind of the pharma giants will outsource this part of the mm-hmm. process? Or do they often or have they in the past done all of it in-house? I mean, you, you provide the facilities and uh, a lot of most of the people is it and yeah then- it's like i guess our our value proposition is that we have some uh, like a world-class headquarters uh, with state-of-the-art laboratories world-class team uh, and then we have our own modules of our own ip and i guess that combination creates like i'd often say to our clients kind of like a playground where they get to kind of develop new ideas and, and innovation that just wouldn't be possible within the bounds of even some of the biggest pharma companies um i think you, to answer your question like it's uh Typically, these the, the largest pharma companies, absolutely, they would have internalized everything, you know, from, you know, uh, sales, marketing, discovery, manufacturing, development, IT, security, you can name it. Um, but I guess the trend over time is that, uh, you know, shareholders and most importantly, patients are looking for companies to do things in a more innovative and streamlined way. So what that's led to is, is essentially the mass like I say, the, the disaggregation of the of the sector. There's a lot of companies that have formed off the back of that. Um, great Irish success stories, like a company like Icon, completely different space to ourselves, but a billion dollar company doing huge things, all based on the fact that they've come up with some great capability that companies want to tap into. Okay, take us back to to young Mark. Uh, yeah. What was happening in 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 your younger years that put you uh, onto this road? Uh, yeah, it's sort of yeah, it's interesting reflecting on that. Um, uh, and I, I do feel that entrepreneurs aren't born. Maybe it's a lot about the journey that you go on that helps you, you, you to become an entrepreneur. Um, I guess young Mark, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I have two brothers, so I was uh, the youngest as well. So I kind of had to fight my corner a lot when I was growing up, which was good fun. Um, I did outgrow my brothers at one point, which kind of gave me a bit more... <laughs> uh, you know, a bit more steel to protect myself. But uh, growing up, I guess the most important part of my journey, I think, was... Uh, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur, had his own business back in the uh, late 70s, 80s, 90s and into the 90s. And um, seeing him, he business about 20 people in it. But uh, the big thing I took from it was the determination and guile that he had to kind of, you know, go out and fight his own corner, create opportunity for the family and put us through school and everything like that. So that was a hugely important thing on reflection that my dad would all often reference the periods in his time when things were great or things were difficult yeah. and, I, and I definitely learned a huge amount What, what field is he in? He's in publishing, marketing, actually maybe the Joe of maybe 20 years ago or 30 <laughs> years ago, very different, but in publishing in uh, jobs, uh, job uh, papers and uh, car magazines and stuff right. like that, advertising. So, and, and you were saying that he kind of, should we say, included you in the the high points or the low points as well as the high points? Yeah, kind of, I, I think now he... Uh, we can story tell about those because I actually understand what he was going through. Obviously, when you're younger, you, you, it's a bit of a, a haze. And sometimes parents will try to shield their kids yeah, from that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Look at my dad. It was great growing up. He got me involved in different aspects of his business. I remember, 
you know, when I was sort of a teenager, he had me cold calling people for kind of advertising opportunities, had me like looking up through the buy and sell, looking at different ads he could maybe try take and stuff like that. So I, I appreciated the fact that uh, business was about rolling up your sleeves and just a good bit of determination. I think if you actually decide you want to do something, you can do it. Um, and that's uh, that's I think what I learned from my dad and uh, my mom was also involved in his business and she's actually involved in, in, in APC she's in our finance department and I see the same maybe their, their family values I don't know any difference but I see those values and I think it's something that I hold close to my heart is that I I, I try to emulate those values and represent what my parents taught me that's a big thing about uh, how, I, how I lead my life but certainly at the outset when you kind of went down the path of, mm. of chemical engineering, that wasn't following in their footsteps. I mean, was there something you experienced in those days of cold calling and trying to get advertising? <laughs> you said, oh, you know, I think I want to do something else. Yeah, like I was always in school, I was always interested in uh, science, chemistry in particular, maths. Um, and actually my, my eldest brother uh, did chemical engineering. He actually did a PhD with the professor I did my PhD with. So there was kind of, I'd say, yeah, there was, things happening in my life where I could sort of say, geez, I'm interested in that. My other brother did engineering, civil engineering. And I remember at the time I was thinking about both of them and, and the, the chemistry element really drove me on to do chem eng. And um, yeah, that was probably my first, maybe when I was around 16 or so, that was my first sort of step in my career in saying that actually I wanted to do this, if you know what I mean. So uh, I look back on that very fondly and it's probably you know, obviously the most important decision I've ever made. Hmm. So you uh, pursued it, you studied it, yep. you went to work at it. Um, what what was going on in the back of your mind that made you uh, start doing, you know, start to plan to do something for yourself? Um, you know, I, I so I, I gathered the skills. That was one of the things. So I was really focused on that. And then uh, after my postgrad, I went and worked for uh, a large pharma company. Phenomenal experience, but it, it gave me an indication that, geez, even in the biggest companies on the planet, like that have you know massive market capitalization that there is opportunities to innovate so you know and one thing that i had i think i i i wanted to be in an environment that was full of like dynamism change innovation so i actually went back and did a postdoc which is kind of basically more academic research but under the guise with my professor that we said look let's just talk to all these pharma companies be it in ireland the us all over europe let's talk to them about the ideas we have, the capabilities we want to develop, kind of like a vision, a storytelling process. So I kind of went through that for about four or five months with uh, a number of big pharma companies that knew uh, myself and Brian uh, through our academic publications, through conferences, through trade shows, things like that. And we basically, I just sort of painted a picture of the future where I wanted to take these ideas. And what was incredible is that uh, some people backed us with nothing. We had no infrastructure no you know like this place no studio we had no capability in terms of people infrastructure but they backed the idea and they're willing to pay us for the idea which was incredible so you 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 know you know facilities even though facilities was what you wanted to uh what you wanted to sell effectively mm. um just talk to me though about how you spotted the opportunity where you saw like there's a gap that we can fill um i think we are exposed uh, to a company in the US and they had a, a, a product, it was for schizophrenia. And uh, we met a VP over there, so kind of a senior meeting for an early stage company. And um, he said, I've heard what you do. I heard about you know all these ideas you had, can you help? And I guess maybe in the humility of that, a person like that who has massive budgets, has you know hundreds of headcounts, for someone like that to reach across the table and sort of say, here, we actually genuinely need your help, not only in, you know, the science, the engineering, but just actually helping them develop this product. And uh, he was under huge pressure to try to get this, you know, what is a, an incredibly important product for the market onto the market. And I guess he was reliant on our early, early stage ideas to make it happen. So that to me was the light bulb moment. That was the, in that meeting, that person committed significant uh, remuneration, like a c considerable money to us. And I guess that was the first time I felt, right, it's being put to us now. Uh, I've got to do something with these ideas and make it happen. So kind of that was my probably the light bulb moment where I became maybe not a, a the idea type of entrepreneurship, but actually making it happen, which is another side of the story, I guess. So you didn't just start with an idea. You started effectively with a contract. I mean, yeah, did, that, yeah. did that make it easier to just to, to get off the ground? Because suddenly there's somebody offering you this. Yeah, Here, yeah. Here's a job for you to do. Here's some money. Please do it. Yeah, like, and that that's a real important part of our, our, our story. Myself and Brian always spoke about um, we wanted to take science, chemical engineering 
to a global stage, but do it from Ireland. And we felt that we had the ability and we needed to back ourselves and back anyone in the team to do that. And what that's led us down is the, a journey that has been independent of any venture capital or private equity. So the, the business is self-funded and it's been those early stage commitments from those companies who are trying to do special things for their patients. It's been that sort of journey that has led us to do, I think, pretty a pretty unique unique things like, you know, and, and, and I am proud to say that, you know, process sciences, analytical sciences, engineering, we are doing things that are globally unique from Ireland on the foothills of the Dublin Wicklow Mountains. And that's really, really important thing that motivates me. You know, uh, And you've gone on to achieve, you know, re- really great things. But I want to hear a little bit more about the, you know, getting getting running and what obstacles, if any, yeah, yeah. that you face in actually getting off the ground. Yeah, I think the looking back on it, Personally, maybe this is just my own, and I, maybe I can try comment on on some of the other team. But for my own self, I think it was the psychology of it, taking that leap of faith and backing your own ability. And I think um, in the sector we're in, I, I'd say I, I, I'd put you know APC, and then obviously you can la- name all these big, massive pharmaceutical companies. So the psychology of saying that actually we can do something that maybe those companies can't or find difficult, I think that was maybe the big personal side of the story for me um i think probably the the challenges like i look back you know i had to give up so many different things in my in life as an avid rugby player that had to disappear uh, the stitches in the face and the black eyes didn't wash too well with the u.s uh, client base it did with the irish side of the business but not with the u.s uh, and i'd say personal relationships with friends and family just probably diminished a little bit because i was doing 70 percent travel uh, I was over the States three days, back two days here, back for the weekend in the US for a week. And run. Yeah, it was just insane. So personally, I think that was the, maybe the, you don't even think of it as downside. That's that's great stuff to be doing too. But looking back on it, that was pretty uh, maybe difficult to do for people that were around me in terms of my friends and family. You, you know? talk about looking back, but we're not actually talking about that long ago, no. are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two, that's like 2000. Uh, 11, 12, we hired our first person January uh, 2012 and we've basically just been hiring people ever since, which is fantastic. So, uh, uh, and, and again, the, it's the it's the Irish element of that story in, in doing R&D and science that makes myself and Brian extremely proud. That's what, that's what keeps us interested, you know. What are the big leaps forward? What were the times when you really said, wow, what's happened here? <laughs> yeah, um, so back in um, again, not too not too long ago, but around the end of twenty fourteen, we were just under huge pressure in terms of the volume of people or business that we were getting, and um, we kind of myself and Brian had this early stage plan. We needed to get outside the bounds of the university. Uh, like I was saying to you earlier, like I think if you want, um, if you're painting a picture of the future about APC and the vision, what you want to try to do, patient impact. Because um, because previously you were working within yeah in the university uh-huh. um so I think like you know when you're trying to attract let's say talent um and also uh, your client base uh, being based in the university I think yeah, it's a great part of the story but ultimately it's not the end goal so the first five year plan we had was to try capitalize around facility and we are really proud to have done that we did it without any I mentioned private equity VC or even bank debt we kind of just went and and. and made a multi-million euro investment in our own uh, facility, which we've since invested significant sums of money into. Uh, so that was probably, in terms of m- my own personal entrepreneurial journey, that's what I, I look back on with such pride. We just simply backed the people in the business to deliver. Like, you know, we, we were spending money we didn't have, but with the view that if we did, people would step up, uh, the culture would just transform, or not transform, it was, it was fantastic, but just really amplify uh, and uh, we went on and did some incredible things. So that was kind of, we moved into the facility, started 2016, and the company subsequently has nearly trebled in size. So we've kind of done some good things since then. Is that the difference between an entrepreneur and, you know, a risk taker and somebody who wouldn't have taken that risk? Um, maybe in my interpretation of it, maybe, yeah. Um, I think m- my interpretation of entrepreneurship is that you, you do live in this sort of sphere of anxiety. I actually don't think if you have if you have no anxiety, I actually don't think you perform to your best. So I quite like that the tension between finance, operations, HR, client relationships, travel, all the rest. I, I kind of like that, but that is the difficult part of it. Um, but I mean, it, where did the money come from? Um, <laughs> from hard work. You know, that's the that's the reality of it. I I think yeah, uh, our 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 team 
we're doing ex- in extraordinary things and our, our I guess the people that we work with our clients pharma companies all over the world like you know we work with this is the interesting thing we work with uh, half our revenue comes from the US about about 20 30 percent from mainland Europe so it's a heavily export driven based business and our clients simply were willing to back us so they were giving us uh you know just contractual commitments that was making myself uh, and the the management team confident in making significant reinvestments back in the business so that's but, kind but, of but was it basically the money that, that may, most people would just have as a safety buffer or the money to pay next month's paychecks or kind yeah, of yeah. something like that that you just we're put, continually reinvesting like i think that's the the appetite for entrepreneurship i think is driven by your appetite to reinvest and that's my own personal interpretation of it but i look at the team and what we've done we just have to keep reinvesting in our own internal innovation and research capabilities. So I think that that was the the kind of moment in our journey where it, it really needed to happen. And I'm delighted that we actually made the decision to, to back it. We actually made a commitment. It's it's amazing looking back. I can't believe that we actually did it. I think we're mad, but it was brilliant that we did it. Uh, we backed the kind of investment to fit out about 30,000 square feet of uh, lab and office space. And then we kind of got to the end about three months later that that started to kick off started building and we said let's do another 30,000 square feet and we kind of went and did that which is kind of just you know you don't have the business systems telling you like what's going to happen you're just backing the team to deliver and that's what uh, yeah, I'm really proud of in APC So Mark from what I understand the uh, the ambition for future growth hasn't been dampened there's there's big plans afoot Yeah you, we just uh, we just completed a uh, a 10 million euro investment in uh, the facility a build out of sort of biologics factories of the future like designing uh, personalized medicines of the future that are kind of uh, specific to certain types of uh, cancers and, and things like that so yeah really proud to have done that and uh, you know the plan is to grow locally obviously in, in Dublin which is a really important part of the story so we have plans to kind of uh, recruit over 100 people in the in the coming couple of years uh, that will bring the business over 250 staff and then um we're looking at opening an office in Boston in January, which is kind of the next part of the story, which I'm excited about. Mm. And how do you, why Boston? And I mean, why do you, why are you focusing on that as a as a location? Uh, yeah, we, we we have a huge number of clients in the area, and uh, if we're looking at the total total number of medicines that are being discovered and developed, Boston is a is a is a well known hub for that. So we just want to be, I guess, closer to uh, our clients, and also uh, there's a lot of innovation in the area that would kind of marry well with what we're trying to do on the technical side. And you want good. to be basically where it's happening. But yeah, I yeah, do yeah. understand there's also a, a plan, perhaps a more medium term plan to go eastwards, as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like we're, we're also looking at um, prospecting opportunities in Singapore. So we do have activities uh, out in Japan and Singapore. We're looking at potentially a, an office out there as well. So I guess what we want to try to do is expand our reach in terms of uh, sales, marketing, relationship management, uh, and maybe in the near term, focus the scientific value proposition around what we're doing here in Ireland. Hmm. What um, you know? What are the challenges in running a business like yours from Ireland? Because it sounds like you're very committed to doing it here, mm. and obviously you're from here and all the rest. But are there obstacles that perhaps the the, the you know that w- most people wouldn't realise? Um, I I'm struggling to find. It comes up a lot in dialogue within the the various the. Uh, entrepreneur networking groups like I haven't really experienced huge ones uh, to date I really like the uh, the cultural aspect of Ireland travels so so well like we're, we're respected all over the world I think we're known for uh, it might be chance in our arm but willing to take a risk and, and and stretching towards achieving things which I think is a healthy appetite in leading a business um, we've recruited people all over the world and actually the, the one thing they say about Ireland is they like the, the language element the cultural element and I think it's safe and I think in the modern world when you're moving families all over the world to, 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 to join APC. That's a really important element of the story. So today it's actually been great. It's been really, really positive. Uh, and obviously, you know, the particularly Dublin, but also elsewhere in Ireland is mm. a, a melting pot of, of different cultures now, but also different companies in different yep. parts of the world. Setting up here, let's face it, pretty much for, for, for tax purposes. But, uh, you know, is it as easy? There's often criticism uh, of the government for not doing enough to actually foster homegrown companies sure. like yours do yeah. you think could you know su- yeah, yeah. locally grown success stories like like your own have been helped more yeah. in the past yeah uh, yeah I, I, I think that's a real fair point like I do like sometimes wish the national agenda pivoted more towards uh, homegrown uh, talent uh, homegrown companies uh, I believe that's the future I think that the uh, the FDI based uh, 
element to our economy is fantastic, but like I think it's really the indigenous element that is going to drive the volume of sustainable employment that we kind of uh, that we need. And obviously, maybe I'm a bit biased because I, I'm in an Irish company, but um, I do feel that uh, the you know our strategy has to be towards the indigenous element of what we're trying to do. Like sometimes I actually feel disappointed that there's thousands of people working in maybe some new tech company launches a strategy in Dublin or wherever. And I'm like just thinking of the volume of Irish talents that could be utilized to create other Irish businesses or to work in Irish businesses themselves. So, um, but you know, I, I think it's a good mix, but I, I, I do feel the the Irish element is probably a, a part of the a story we need to bolster a bit more. Do you think maybe there's a reason that that talent is not being maximized? Um, Maybe like you could be cynical and say that the, the Irish companies don't have the opportunity landscape or the investments, whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, I, I think from the government down, we need to kind of foster and incentivize the entrepreneurial element of, of what Irish people are doing on a day to day basis. Um, and I think if they get that kind of incentivization right and, you know, that would encourage more people into the sector of creating new the new opportunities for Ireland that are Irish opportunities. Mm. I mean, the scale of ambition, I suppose, Ireland's a uh, relatively small market mm. and obviously increasingly uh, all companies are internationally focused. But do you think maybe our uh, Irish entrepreneurs, potential Irish entrepreneurs' ideas maybe just limited by the, the scale of the market? Maybe they should be thinking more more globally? May, yeah, that's again that's a that's a fair point like and maybe and again I, like no story is the right story but looking back on what we did the first the first thing we did is we bought a, a plane ticket to the US I didn't I, and at the time I didn't actually know why but looking back and it was like we were just naturally selecting that there is just such huge opportunity over there we didn't do any total available market assessment or any analysis we just said geez there's so many companies over there let's go over and talk to them and, and I think that you know over history Ireland is known to look outside the bounds of you know this island and I think we just need to encourage the same within you know within the millennial group and others that you know they feel empowered to kind of go explore the world and explore the opportunities that are, are present well what have you learned from say the entrepreneurial spirit of the US yeah uh, like I think you know failure is a good thing I think um, they're really open to things that are different so actually, if it doesn't sit within their current business system or budgeting process or whatever it may be, they'll definitely hear out the idea and will have appetite to try it out. I think that's definitely something that I've learned. So we would do a lot of our, you know, if we're developing a minimal viable product or a new idea, we definitely would, would look to uh, to pitch it to US companies for sure. Uh, you get some great insight. They're very open about providing you ways to develop your technology or services, whatever it may be. That's a real, real thing. That, that, that's a great attribute to the US, I think. Mm. I mean, I know part of your education was, was actually spent in the US. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to be selected to go on a program over uh, to NASA and Florida Institute of Technology uh, back in, oh, it's like 2005 or something like that, prior to doing the postgrad. But it was a government initiative to try to get Irish people interested in research to be mentored by like, you know, life science experts in NASA and astronauts. And my mentor was a two-time astronaut. He was a chemical engineer. Pretty, um, pretty Very inspirational. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty inspirational uh, figure. He had his own jet. I just thought all this was pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, but it, that definitely gave me a sense that, geez, the, the possibilities are endless. Like uh, there was people over there that had, you know, they are great ideas, but they weren't it was just maybe more the determination to make it happen. So that's what I, t I took from that experience was that, um, you know, you can do science engineering, you can do any type of business idea at a global stage. You can do it from Ireland. Uh, like, why not? You know, so I've yet to find anyone to give me a reason why you can't. So there, there's, uh, you know, a great attitude and perhaps a great admiration uh, in the US, for example, for, for people's success. Mm. Perhaps, is it, do you think is that shared over here or is there an element of begrudgery? Um, I think it just it manifests itself in different ways. I think in the US, people are just used to, um, you know, uh, maybe new ideas, entrepreneur, venture capital, private equity, businesses succeeding, businesses failing. Maybe it's just not a natural part of our storytelling. Um, in, you know, that's maybe my my own experience. Um, not maybe begrudgery, but maybe sometimes just, you know, some people might look at someone who leads a business and they think that they, you know, you know, 
they've made it they have it all when the reality is the the volume of effort dedication and sacrifice that goes into it is uh, sometimes worth it and sometimes it's not you know and maybe just in the Irish guys we, sometimes we don't provoke the right response to maybe success or failure you know hmm. have you experienced that yourself um maybe like in um yeah maybe in the business sense you do it, it crops up every now and then when you know, you know people just and it's not just in ireland it's in, it's in many different countries like you know people just don't actually really get it but um you know the, my experiences today have been absolutely positive with maybe just the the odd sprinkling of 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 a bit of confusion as to what the hell you're doing and why you're doing it you know <laughs> Yeah. Well, talk to me a little bit more about the work that you are involved in, because mm-hmm. I would imagine down through the years, there must have been some particular projects that you are, should we say, particularly yeah, proud yeah. to have been part of. Absolutely. Like there's a there's a couple of uh, ones at the moment. Uh, we are at the f- we're at the forefront of this sort of technical innovation in cell and gene therapies. These are personalized medicines that are specific to uh, any particular mutation in cancer or whatever it may be. Um, and we are the first company to come up with a, a, a process, a, a manufacturing platform to process a, a a cell therapy that was associated to a particular form of cancer. I won't mention the one because it's a, a breach of confidentiality, but it was the the um, the survival rate was uh, less than 20% over the course of three years. This drug would bring it to a survival rate of over 80%. So through our kind of innovation and uh, engineering related research, uh, people have take been able to take his rug and are alive as a result so that's really empowering um and i think the team don't actually you know there's 130 odd people now in apc they actually convey in that message you know people need to be empowered by that that's something special so like that's kind of uh something like that's a that's a program of research that we're still involved in and is pre- pretty uh pretty incredible yeah. I mean, as the kind of the, the, the outsourced partner, I mean, obviously you are working hands in glove with yeah. these pharma companies, but do you think your your people and yourself feel as part of the success stories as the, the people who, who kind of come to you to sure. give you the work in the first place? Yeah, like, yeah, we have our, our we have patient advocacy groups come in and talk about uh, the impact. Like we have a whole portfolio of different medicines we're working on from you know, Alzheimer's, leukemia, different HIV, respiratory based uh, ailments. And uh, we have the their patient advocacy groups come in and talk about the empowerment that these new medications will give them in their daily lives. And also our clients come in and give an, an understanding of the, the volume of patients, the survival rate or lack of survival in many cases, which is the infor- unfortunate scenario. And uh, yeah, once a quarter, we, we outline the patient impact the research is having. It's an incredibly important part to why people join APC. They're joining to bring science and engineering to a global stage, but to have that patient impact. And that's, I guess, that's what we're empowering them to do. You're obviously very in tune to the whole field of, of, of medical research and, and, and drugs research. Mm-hmm. What's your view of it as somebody who is kind of, shall we say, uh, you know, facilitating it rather than mm-hmm. being directly involved in it? You mm-hmm. know, are, are these various companies, are they chasing particular treatments for the for the right reasons or are they chasing profits in some cases um yeah like i, I think that the whole industry has just been completely changed and even in the the lifetime since i've been involved in it there's been such a dramatic change like companies now are looking at the development of very specific or niche based medicines that maybe the patient pools aren't in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions they, they could be in the the hundreds of people which is a completely different value proposition to what the pharmaceutical or biotech industry was doing 10 15 20 years ago they're developing mass products you know could be cardiology based products uh, or diabetes which is treating tens of millions whereas now the the focus is definitely towards these niche based medicines personalized medicines medicines that affect very small populations of people and there's an unmet need so i do i do feel the integrity and the mission of that is fantastic um and then it comes into like how that's financed and how it's paid for. It, it's difficult because the industry is structured around, you know, selling large volumes of, of life-saving medicine uh, to patients all over the world. And the, this business model may change that. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. But I, but I don't think it's a profit chase. I think there is there is an unmet need that is being chased and being solved by truly innovative science and to be part of that is fantastic. Is there such a thing as a kind of maybe not quite pro bono, but almost, you know, uh, charitably funded work in that field where perhaps you're charged with or there's an encouragement mm. to kind of push forward and invest in a drug that might 
help lots of people yep. but might not ultimately make that much money for those involved yeah like, and that's def- that's definitely happening now like with the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation like there's foundations like that government led or, or by through philanthropy that is investing in um, products that maybe sometimes may not get it to market because there's the, maybe the the patient or business need isn't there but it could help you know huge volumes of people be it in third world or others so that that, that is happening definitely and we get solicited through those foundations also to try help you know, it be it could be uh, drugs and processes associated to malaria or typhoid drugs, things that have been around for tens, hundreds of years, but still across the globe aren't solved. So that 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 is happening. There is foundations that are looking looking after that. Let's talk a little bit more about you. Sure, um, great. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not just about you, but I mean, you know, you, you mentioned earlier uh, about the long hours, the, the the giving up of rugby, the not seeing family as much as uh, you used to or you might yeah. have liked to. Does that continue? Is that still the case? Uh, no, I think, well, my mom works in the business, so I see her every day. Um, but uh, no, I think I have the balance right a lot better now. Like, I'm actually a lot calmer, like if I was to look at myself in, in, in comparison to what I was like several years ago. Uh, I, I feel um, a lot of calmness. I'm... I'm, I'm uh, recently married so that's that's helping too so um but i, I think i've a, I have a better work life balance than i used to, and i certainly encourage that within uh, within apc i'd say in the early days we probably didn't have that right didn't have the right the right roles right business system everybody just wanted to do everything all the time whereas i think we have a we have a better balance now yeah so uh, i think i'm i'm in a better place and certainly uh, loving every element of my personal and professional life there's not many entrepreneurs in their you know mid 30s who can say that their hardest working days are behind them though oh, i don't know about that jeez you know maybe the uh, the frantic nature of what i'm doing is less but i think i'm uh, the pressure on being effective in the decision making that I have to make now is is, is uh, very significant. So maybe the pressure burden isn't any less, but maybe the, the frantic nature of how I work. Maybe I've just learned how to be a better leader and a, and more effective at what I do. So and maybe working smarter instead of working harder. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. So just doing uh, putting the right roles and responsibilities into the organisation. The everything from you know the right focus areas, right incentives, right budgets. But then having a strategic plan that will enable the business to uh, to more than double in size in the next couple of years. That's where the pressure is. Maybe it's a forward-looking pressure as opposed mm. to a, a right-now pressure. You know? So perhaps the worst is yet to come. Well, that's <laughs> potentially it. That's the risk. And I think that's the that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, you, you achieve something, but you're immediately, you don't actually get to enjoy the success as such because you're more thinking and positioned about the future. And that's kind of maybe where I sit today. Well, have you put any kind of coping strategies into place to to limit that stress that you had to deal with before? Yeah, I have like a, I have a coach. um, So, which is kind of uh, outside um, uh, the business, but have a coach that kind of, uh, you know, it's not about a friendly conversation. It's actually giving me, it's about giving me constructive feedback Um understand about elements how I need to develop um, and where I need to put pressure on myself so actually that's a that's a healthy process because you can actually bring in all elements of the business and maybe even personal things that maybe it's difficult to discuss with uh, peers in, in work even my co-founder um, so yeah that's that's something that I, I use kind of quite frequently well, without giving all the coaches secrets away because yeah. they still have to make some money um, <laughs> <laughs> can you give us exam- an example of something that you've taken on in terms of that their advice yeah, I think um, like wh- one of the things I'd say probably I-, I wasn't great at was kind of cascading down the organization visibility about decision making, uh, the financial elements and budgets and planning and stuff like that. So that's definitely something that like, you know, I had to I thought if I painted the picture for the future, gave people a sense of how we're going to do it, that the operation operational execution would just happen. But I- I've had to start to spend a lot more time and recruited in some world class people. Uh, on the operational side to help me uh, sort of do that and ultimately it's, I, I definitely don't have the skills for that so in a way um, the coach was advising me to kind of uh, find people who have far better talent than I do in that space so uh, that's that's maybe an example of how, uh, how I've taken on board what they've had to say and what about tidbits from other entrepreneurs maybe even within the EOY network kind of uh, yeah, coping yeah. strategies or best practices from them yeah what's look and it's it's probably it is a cliche like what's fun what i've taken from the experience with uh, ey the other networking groups is that w- we're all facing the same opportunities so everybody's got growth opportunities all the rest and everybody has challenges as well and actually the, ch- the challenges manifest themselves in actually the same guys again and again and again and again so like you know 
if it's HR related items, financing, uh, client related ones, acquisition related ones. Like I had a, a great conversation last week with one of my now friends within the network or whatever talking about, you know, growth strategy versus, you know, organic growth versus acquisition. You know, it's fantastic kind of network to, to tap into. Um, like, you know, it, something that a board can't even offer, I don't think, you know, that, that network is, is incredibly valuable. So what does the future look like for APC? I mean, obviously, you've got your growth plans on the horizon, Boston, yep. maybe Singapore in the, the medium term. But the, the outlook for the market in general, will it always be a, a an independent facilitator of other pharma mm. companies? Or do you kind of foresee some level of consolidation? Um, so, like, I, I think the future is very clear for us uh, in the next five years that the, the market opportunity for what we do is is incredibly large, thankfully. Um, so, you know, we, we want to be at the forefront of new emerging medicines, like one therapeutic area I'm particularly interested in is Alzheimer's and the lack of ability to generate uh, new molecular or biomolecular entities to solve that ailment. So I definitely have a passion for the business to, to support that area. And that's what we're, we're, we're ultimately trying to do. Uh, the other area that I, I'm really interested in is uh, I've mentioned earlier is this uh, factories of the future. Like I think for providing uh, medicines to uh, developing territories or third world based territories, I think you have to have innovative ways in terms of how you make and supply those medicines. So I definitely would like to be tied to some innovative, you know, miniaturized factories that can provide medicines to these areas in the world. So that's something that I'm uh, I'm interested in pursuing, whether that's in the guise of APC or, or other well, that, opportunities. Yeah, I mean, that brings uh, me on to, to um, probably my final question. You know, lots of people who have built something of, of, of your scale uh, at your stage in life mm. don't necessarily stick with it. They mm. build it, maybe they move on to something else. Do yeah. you see yourself as being falling into that category or the, the kind of the, the lifer category? Uh, I'm I'm in it with with ABC like and I'd be very clear with the team like uh, I think it's my obligation to the vision we have and the team that we have that uh, that I stay true to my commitment to that business so that's that's un- undoubtedly the uh, the focus I think as my my skill set as an executive uh, diversifies I'd say there's going to be other opportunities that we identify and it'd be great to incorporate those into APC or to to initiate other businesses but I think my one uh, one focus for the immediate near medium and long term definitely is is APC I'm, I'm absolutely uh, you know I'm humbled to be involved in it like like I have a chance to do something that very few people have the chance to do like why not try to do it yeah it's mm-hmm. pretty amazing to even be able to say that um, but yeah I, I, as a result of that I owe it to people to, to really give it a shot okay Mark Barrett thank you very much yeah thanks Thanks for joining us today on The Architects of Business. Thanks to our guest, Mark Barrett, our producer, Patrick Hohey, and all of the team here at Joe. Our programme is made in partnership with EOI Entrepreneur of the Year. Go to eoi.ie to learn more about the finalists for this year. And don't miss out on past or future shows by subscribing for free on iTunes, on your favourite Android podcast app, or you can watch us on YouTube. Check out some of Joe's other shows too, including Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby and Ireland Unfiltered with Dion Fanning. I'm Ty Genwright. Thanks so much for being with us today and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.